Tonight's event is called the Jesus Conflict. It will be a debate on the question of who is Jesus and whether or not he rose from the dead. The speakers of tonight will be Tony Costa and Shabir Ali. Tony Costa has earned a BA and an MA in the study of religion from the University of Toronto. He is currently a PhD candidate with the University of Pretoria in New Testament studies. Tony is also a member of the Society of Biblical Literature and, Evan and the Evangelical Theological Society. Tony frequently lectures in various churches throughout Ontario and has been on numerous television shows, including 100 Huntley Street and the Michael Corrin Show. Shabir Ali holds a BA in Religious Studies from Laurentian University in Sudbury, Ontario, with a specialization in Biblical Literature and a Master's in Religious Studies from the University of Toronto with a specialization in Quranic Studies. He is now in his third year of a PhD in Quranic Studies at the University of Toronto. He is also the president of the Islamic Information and Dawa Center International in Toronto, where he functions as Imam. He travels internationally to represent Islam in public lectures and interfaith dialogues. He explains Islam on a weekly television program called Let the Quran Speak. And this is on um, the Vision Channel every Saturday night at 4 p.m. And past episodes of this can be seen at www.shabirali.com. Tonight's format is one in which the speakers, the speaker, one speaker will go first and speak for 15 minutes explaining their answer to the question of who is Jesus and did he rise from the dead. Then each speaker will have the opportunity to present a seven minute rebuttal to each other's presentations, after which the speaker will have the opportunity to engage the audience with five minutes of closing remarks. At that point, the formal part of the debate will come to an end and there will be a brief break, at which point we would also like to get your feedback and your comments on this event. There will also be a question and answer period. At this point, we just ask that you turn off any cell phones that you might have and just to comment that tonight's debate will be appearing at the conflict at www.theconflict.ca in a few days. So if you happen to ask a question, uh, there's actually a consent form at the podium where you'll be asking uh, because this will be posted online. So if you're asking a question, just please recognize that there is a chance you will be appearing on the internet. Please join me in thanking the debaters for coming tonight. And the first speaker will be... Mr. Costa. Thank you. Good evening. Just want to check the sound. if. I'm on? I'm on. Thank you. Well, good evening, and uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Campus for Christ and uh, Muslim Student Association uh, for making this event possible. Uh, yesterday, Shabir and I were at the University of Waterloo, and we dealt with the question, who is Jesus? And I made the argument last night that Jesus had a filial consciousness, that is, that Jesus had an understanding that he was the Son of God in a special sense, and we looked at um, a number of New Testament passages that scholars deem to be authentic sayings of the historical Jesus. But ultimately, the identity of Jesus of Nazareth, and even the Christian movement, which he spawned in the first century, really would not be where it is today. It would not have originated were it not for this event that we call the resurrection. And so we raise the question tonight, did Jesus rise from the dead? The identity of Jesus is closely related to this event. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Romans, quoting a creed that came before his time, a pre-Pauline creed, states the following. 
he talks about, quote, the gospel concerning his son, that is God's son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is an important statement because this creedal statement points out that Jesus was declared to be the son of God by the event of the resurrection. This was the catalyst that created the paradigm shift that altered the thinking of his followers and the world as we know it. The Apostle Paul, who is the one New Testament writer that we know for certain was an eyewitness to the risen Jesus and that he claims that he saw the risen Jesus, he sums it up this way in his letter to the Corinthians. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is, in, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. What Paul is basically saying is that if the resurrection of Jesus did not happen, then the claims of Jesus, the validity of the Christian message is absolutely futile and vain. And therefore, Christianity rests on the bedrock of the resurrection of Jesus. If there was no resurrection, then Christianity really is a sham at the end of the day. And that's essentially what Paul is communicating here. If Christ did not rise from the dead, then really our faith is baseless. Bart Ehrman, a radical critic of the New Testament, writes this, quote, it is a historical fact that some of Jesus' followers came to believe that he had been raised from the dead soon after his crucifixion. There are five arguments that I'm going to propose tonight that New Testament scholars generally have a consensus on, five points that I would like to argue. Number one, the crucifixion of Jesus. Number two, his honorable burial. Number three, the empty tomb discovery. Number four, the post-mortem appearances of the risen Christ. And number five, the origin of the Christian way. Let me begin with the first point, the point of the crucifixion. If there is one thing known about the historical Jesus, the one indisputable fact is that Jesus of Nazareth was executed in the first century by the Roman form known as crucifixion. In fact, every scholar, both in the liberal and conservative camps, are unanimous on this. The only scholars that I can think of that do not believe that Jesus was executed by crucifixion are usually those who don't believe he existed in the first place, because obviously you cannot crucify a phantasm. Now, the chair, the late um, Robert Funk, who was the chair of the Jesus Seminar, stated that the crucifixion of Jesus is, quote, one indisputable fact, close quote, that we know about the historical Jesus. Uh, he is echoed by others like John Dominic Crossan and Bart Ehrman and many, many others who know for certain that this is one thing we know about Jesus. He was put to death by crucifixion. This crucifixion event is not only recorded in the New Testament Gospels, it's affirmed in the letters of the Apostles, the letters of Paul. It's alluded to in the book of Revelation. Jesus is called the, the Lamb who was slain. It is also attested in external sources, in Roman writings by Tacitus and Suetonius, and Jewish writings like, like the Talmud, and in Greek writings like that of Mara Bar Serapion and others who talk about this Jesus. And they talk about how even Pontius Pilate was involved in the execution, the carrying out of the execution of this man. You see, the crucifixion would have dealt a death blow to the following of Jesus. And in fact, when you read the Gospels, what you find is that the disciples of Jesus following his death were in hiding, in absolute fear and chaos. In fact, N.T. Wright, a British scholar of the New Testament, in his tome, The Resurrection of the Son of God, points out that Messianic movements in the first century had one thing in common. For the most part, they were revolutionary movements trying to break off the Roman yoke. But what would happen is that when Messianic leaders would be put to death or killed, the movement would usually disband and it would cease to exist. Why is it that the Christian movement came to continue to exist? Why is it that when Jesus was put to death, his movement simply didn't dissipate into the mists of history? 
Well, because it didn't end there. It could have ended there, but it did not end there. Something happened that caused this movement to reemerge and to explode throughout the Roman Empire. The second point that scholars are generally agreed on is the honorable burial of Jesus of Nazareth. The burial of Jesus is recorded for us in the Gospels, it's recorded for us in the book of Acts, and it's also spoken of by Paul in the early creed that he quotes in 1 Corinthians 15, 3-4, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised again on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared. Paul essentially gives us, in capsule form, a miniature version of the Gospel accounts, the death, the burial, and the resurrection and appearances of Jesus. This event is so grounded in history that it led the Cambridge professor John A.T. Robinson to state that the honorable burial of Jesus is, quote, the earliest and best attested fact about Jesus. And even the radical critic Rudolf Bultmann himself admitted that this was purely historical. There was no embellishment um, of mythology or legendary material in the earliest sources. There's another point that uh, the uh, New Testament scholar James D.G. Dunn has pointed out, and that is there is an absence of the veneration of the tomb of Jesus among his earliest followers. It was the practice in Judaism to regard the tombs as holy relics, where the bones of holy men and rabbis rested, and it was common to visit the tombs of holy men and rabbis, and those tombs were especially marked. Take, for example, in Hebron today, in the Middle East, where they have the tomb of the patriarchs, how this becomes a place of sacrality where people make pilgrimage to. You don't find that in the early accounts of the New Testament. And why is it, James D.G. John asks, the tomb of Jesus did not become a place of pilgrimage? Obviously, because the body was not there. It was the bones of the dead person that gave sacrality to the tomb. The third point is the discovery of the empty tomb. The New Testament Gospels tell us that on the third day following the execution of Jesus, a number of his women disciples came and discovered the tomb to be empty. This empty tomb uh, is attested multiply in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and clearly implied in Paul's letter to the Corinthians where he points out that Christ died and he was buried and he was raised again. The interesting thing about the women here in particular is that in first century Judaism, women had absolutely no legal status as witnesses. And yet what is interesting is that the Gospel writers acclaimed them as the first witnesses to the empty tomb of Jesus. The other thing we have to realize about the empty tomb is that the discovery of the empty tomb also rests on good historical grounds. According to the Austrian specialist in the resurrection, Professor Jacob Kramer, he states, quote, by far, most exegetes hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements concerning the empty tomb. D. H. Van Deleen also points out, it is extremely difficult to object to the empty tomb on historical grounds. Those who deny it do so on the basis of theological or philosophical assumptions. The fourth point that I want to bring out tonight is the post-mortem appearances of Jesus. That is, that the disciples experienced appearances where Jesus would come to them, speak to them, eat in their presence, and communicate with them. The appearances of Jesus are described in the Gospels and in the letter of Paul to the Corinthians as appearances to individuals, to groups of people. He appeared to skeptics like his brother James, to enemies like Saul of Tarsus. He appeared in different locations and in different situations. Gerd Ludemann, who uh, again is a very one of the sharpest critics on the resurrection of Jesus had to concede the point quote it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ and so again we have so far the crucifixion of Jesus the burial of Jesus which would indicate that the burial site of Jesus was known to both Jew and Christian alike. They knew where he was buried. We have the discovery of the empty tomb. We have the post-mortem appearances of Jesus to his disciples. And this leads incontrovertibly to the fifth point. And that is that these four constitute together the fifth point that this marked the origin of the Christian way. And virtually all scholars, again, are unanimous on this. It is, it is an indisputable fact that the origin of the Christian way, way rests on the resurrection of Jesus 
from the dead. Whether you believe he rose from the dead or not is irrelevant. That is a fact that his early disciples truly came to that conviction and the Christian movement began with that point. Luke Johnson uh, of Emory University argues, quote, some sort of powerful transformative experience is required to generate the sort of movement earliest Christianity was. N.T. Wright also admits, quote, that is why as a historian I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. The other point that we should recognize about the resurrection of Jesus is that it is falsifiable. What I mean by that is that the early Christians and the Jews had a concept of bodily resurrection. That is, when they spoke of resurrection, they spoke of the rising up again of the bodies of the deceased. And so, if the early Christians were preaching that Jesus had been bodily raised from the dead, the best way to falsify that claim would be to produce the body. And the antagonists of the Christian movement were never able to do this. Consider another alternative. They could have easily have made an unfalsifiable argument. They could have said, well, Jesus' soul went to heaven, or Jesus' spirit was assumed into heaven. Well, there's no way of disproving that one way or the other. You can't prove that. You can't disprove that. That's an unfalsifiable argument. But with the bodily resurrection, you have something that is falsifiable. And one thing the early antagonists could not do was disprove this. Now, what are some of the consequences of this resurrection? Well, we see a radical change in the disciples of Jesus. Most of them went through their deaths as martyrs, professing Jesus as the Lord, as the risen Christ. The other thing that we should note is the conversion of the brother of Jesus, which Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7. Hans Gross, a prominent German theologian, pointed out that this is one of the strongest arguments for the resurrection of Jesus. His brother, who was an infidel, if you will, who didn't believe in him, we're told in the Gospels that the brothers of Jesus didn't believe in him, he suddenly comes to believe that his brother is the Lord, the risen Christ, and he becomes the leader of the Jerusalem church. Imagine that, those of you who have brothers. I mean, can you imagine if you realize that your brother was the Lord, that he was the risen Christ? And then you have people like Saul of Tarsus, a persecutor, um, a rabid antagonist of the early Christian movement set out to destroy it, to quash it. And yet, he joins the very movement he has set out to destroy. And what is his reason for doing so? The only reason he gives is this. I have seen the Lord. He appeared to me. There's another important point we have to realize, and that is the criterion of dissimilarity that we find in the New Testament. The Jews believed in the resurrection of the dead, but it was an event that was to take place in the last day. And it was to be a corporate event where all the people of God would be raised, some to life and some to punishment. But yet, here we find in the Christian movement something completely dissimilar. You have these followers of Jesus coming to believe that within history, when an individual was raised to immortality. In fact, Raymond Brown says this, Quote, Thus the choice of resurrection language was not an inevitability for the early Jews who believed in Jesus. To the contrary, its choice must be explained. For while there was an expectation among Jews of the resurrection of the dead in the last times, there was no expectation of the resurrection of a single man from the dead separate from and preliminary to the resurrection. The Jews of Jesus' day did not believe in a dying, much less a rising Messiah. So then how did they come to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead? Well, this could not have been a Christian invention because the Christian movement was not yet originally formed yet. It had not come into formation. It couldn't have been a Jewish explanation because the Jews did not believe in a resurrection to immortal life before the end time. So then where did it come from? I think that the best hypothesis to account for what happened is that God raised Jesus from the dead. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, for that uh, delightful presentation. Folks, I begin by praising our creator and fashioner, and I thank him for bringing us together tonight in such an amiable atmosphere in which we can think about things that are important for us in this life and uh, for our eternal salvation. 
Uh, who is Jesus according to the Quran, which is a scripture revealed by God uh, that Muslims believe uh, to be a revelation for all humankind. Uh, Jesus is a prophet, the Messiah, a servant of God, born of Mary, whose uh, depiction in the Quran is similar to that which we find in the Gospel according to Luke. On account of this, Muslims believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he performed many miraculous deeds, and eventually God raised him into heaven and that Jesus eventually, before the end of time, will make a second sojourn. Uh, Muslims then revere Jesus and hold him in very high esteem. And nothing I say here tonight should be construed as being in any way disrespectful to Jesus or even of the Christian faith. The question before us tonight is, did Jesus rise from the dead? This is a historical and an academic question, and it is in the spirit of academic discourse in such an important uh, academic institution uh, that uh, I would like to approach this subject. So we want to look at the history and uh, also the theology where it, it be became attached to and uh, in some way uh, a major factor in shaping that history. Well, I don't want to re respond directly to what Tony said. That will be a little bit unfair, coming right after him and uh, responding to what he said. But uh, there will be a, a portion of our presentations tonight in which uh, we will be responding directly to each other. For my own part, uh, let me just uh, start uh, from scratch and ask, how do we know that Jesus on whom be peace rose from the dead? Well, let me think about the Quranic depiction about what happened in the, in the uh, last uh, event recorded in the Gospels uh, regarding the earthly life of, of Jesus. The Quran is a little bit vague on this question. Uh, Surah 4 verse 157 has been commonly interpreted by Muslim scholars as indicating that Jesus did not die on the cross, he was, that he was not even put on the cross, and that someone miraculously, by the power of God they would say, uh, has been made to look like Jesus, and that someone else was put on the cross, who precisely they, they do not know. Uh, none of this interpretation actually is reported from the Prophet Muhammad on whom be peace, and it seems that what happened was that the Muslim commentators uh, took certain portions of that passage very literally, and uh, they wanted to find some story that will coincide with that very literal interpretation. They understood one portion of that passage to be saying uh, that uh, someone else was made to look like Jesus. Uh, in fact, uh, some others have pointed out that it doesn't actually say that, but uh, they, they settled on this interpretation because it made God look glorious. If the enemies of Jesus were out to seize Jesus and put him on a cross, uh, doesn't it backfire on them if in fact they grabbed the wrong person, if, if in fact they were somehow tricked? And, and they ended up deceiving themselves, thinking that they had crucified the messenger uh, of God, the Messiah, but in fact they had not. So the uh, Muslim commentators search for stories that will uh, coincide with this uh, interpretation that glorifies God, and they found some stories that uh, um, are uh, very old, but not uh, old enough for historians. Historians would want uh, stories uh, that emanate from the first century of Christianity, from the first couple of decades after uh, the crucifixion event, and uh, we, we do not have such early depictions outside of the New Testament uh, as to what precisely happened. What we do have are Roman historians and Jewish historians such as Josephus, Tacitus, Thallus, and others who take it for granted that Jesus was crucified. They take it for granted that he, was, that he died on the cross. And the Muslim must now ask himself, is there any way of interpreting the Quranic narrative here that will coincide with what we now know of history? If the early Muslim commentators um, interpreted the Quran in a way uh, that will coincide with what they knew of the history, meaning what they could find out from their Christian and Jewish informers, uh, could uh, Muslim interpreters now not do the same? In fact, I believe we can. And this is one of the reasons I specialize in Quranic exegesis, because I study these things, how uh, exegesis came to be formed, how they came to be settled as classical uh, commentaries on the Quran, and in what ways it might be possible to revise some of these commentaries while at the same time sticking to the original principles of Quranic interpretation. So I believe that today a Muslim would be quite faithful in understanding that the Quran in saying, Ma qataluhu wa ma salabuhu, they killed him not, nor did they crucify him, in Surah 4 verse 157, is not in fact denying two separate things, but denying two things which are in fact connected and overlapping with each other. It seems that what the Quran is denying is that they crucified or they, they killed Jesus in a general way, they killed him not. And then in, in anticipating 
uh, an objection that someone will say, but wait, we did crucify him. The Quran is now giving a parallel and specific statement that they neither crucified him, meaning that they did not succeed in killing him even in this particular way. Well, I can should be halahum, the Quran says, but so it was made to seem to them. Commentators had taken this to mean that somebody else was made to look like Jesus. But uh, an ancient commentator, also in the classical period, Zamakh Shari, in his uh, Al-Kashaf, a commentary on the Quran, had pointed out that the verse by itself does not actually mean that. It could mean just simply that it was made so to seem to them. So it, it appeared to them. So if we take the Quran uh, literally as it is, uh, and we ask uh, what elements of historical knowledge would in fact uh, coincide with uh, an interpretation that is uh, conducive to the text. It seems to me that what the Quran is saying is that even though the enemies of Jesus plotted and planned and they eventually boasted that they had crucified Jesus and killed him by such uh, an act of crucifixion, uh, they in fact did not kill him in this particular way, though it did appear to them to be so. Now, does that coincide with anything that we know? First of all, does that deny any of the known history that we have just cited from Josephus and Tacitus and others? I believe not. When historians say about a man who lived some 2,000 years ago that this man um, died, um, they are working with the common historical presupposition that a person who was alive 2,000 years ago and is no longer around, even if we didn't know he was dead, we would, even if he were missing, he would be by now presumed dead. If uh, Jesus lived some 2,000 years ago, historians definitely would say about him now that he died, by some means, whatever. And, uh, of course, the ostensible uh, records of any historical event would be taken to be the fact, unless there are some overriding grounds for thinking otherwise. And so the earliest records we have closest to the time of Jesus are, in fact, in New Testament documents, earlier than those historians that we cited. And uh, naturally, these Gospels, the, the Gospels and the other New Testament writings, do say that Jesus died on the cross, and that is what historians will go by. They will say there's no, no reason, no overriding reason for disregarding the evidence that is given in these uh, New Testament writings. However, as E.P. Sanders has pointed out in his book on Paul, Paul, a very short introduction, when someone claims that a person who had been dead previously now appears subsequently to his friends and followers, we would be asking, even if people didn't ask this before, how do you know he was really dead? Now we know in our modern times we have a battery of tests to make sure that the person is really dead. And that's, this comes after a long history of mistakes that have been made in burying people uh, before their time was really up. Uh, how do you differentiate between a person who is in a deep sleep, in a coma, and a person who is actually permanently dead? Well, nowadays we have the EEG test, the ECG test, and we have a battery of uh, response tests to make sure that the person is absolutely dead. And even then, we have invented the modern morgue to place a person there in holding for a little while at least, till we are so certain that the person is dead that burial should be without any error or mistake. Now, it seems that in the ancient world, there were mistakes being made. And there's an interesting uh, reference that I brought to share with you from a book by John Rousseau and Rami Arav, a book uh, entitled Jesus and His World, an Archaeological and Cultural Dictionary. They actually cite a passage from the uh, Talmud, uh, which um, actually um, encourages people to go and visit the tombs of dead persons uh, on, on the third day. Um, because they said that mistakes have been made in the past, people have been buried uh, alive and it uh, was possible uh, that a person might be discovered uh, to be alive. And they said that there was actually the case of one particular person who was found to be alive when his tomb was visited uh, on the third day and uh, he went on to have children. So in that case, we have an explanation for why the female disciples of Jesus went to visit the tomb on, on the third day. Uh, some of the Gospels have it that the, disciples, that the women were going to anoint the body of Jesus with spices. But think about it. The Gospel according to John says that Jesus at the time of his burial was anointed already and wrapped in 120 pounds of uh, myrrh and aloes. He was already given all of the spicing uh, to be prepared for burial. And all the Gospels assure us that the women were close at hand, so they were aware of the proceedings. Why would they then go out of their way, even on the Sabbath or just shortly after the Sabbath, to go and find spices uh, in order to uh, anoint the body of, of Jesus? 
Moreover, how would you anoint a, bo a body that is already dead and decomposing three days after the fact when the methods of preservation were not already applied to that body? So it seems that the women were not going to anoint the body with spices, but they were going merely to see the tomb. Um, scholars generally agree that Matthew's Gospel is the most Jewish of the four Gospels. Matthew's Gospel shows more knowledge of Jewish customs and traditions than the others do. And Matthew's Gospel, curiously enough, does not say that they went to anoint the body of Jesus. He merely says that they went to see the tomb. Now, Jesus obviously was dead. But was he so obviously dead? Was he as dead as John the Baptist was? John the Baptist's head was uh, severed and his head was delivered up on a platter. You can be sure that this man is dead. But does crucifixion kill a person quickly? Josephus, a Jewish historian from the time, actually writes that on one occasion he was uh, uh, surprised when he arrived into town and he found that three of his friends were crucified. And he used his influence to have them removed from the cross and given medical attention. Two of them died anyway, but one of them did survive. According to the best studies done on crucifixion, it takes uh, a few days for the crucified victim to die. As uh, the uh, British scholar Tom Wright pointed out, and the point of crucifixion was not to inflict pain on the person, even though it did inflict excruciating pain. But the point of crucifixion, uh, more so, was not to kill the person quickly, but to put him to shame. And the longer you had him hanging on the cross, naked and exposed to all of the elements and to onlookers at the crossroads where everyone would pass by and mock you, that was the point of crucifixion, to keep you in this situation of shame. So they actually would give you the drugs to prolong life rather than to kill you. Is it possible that Jesus survived the cross? Well, yes. The Gospels narrate that uh, Jesus was killed under the aegis of the, Pont uh, of the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. But Pontius Pilate, according to the Gospels themselves, did not have a vested interest in killing Jesus. Rather, he must have had the opposite. On several occasions, he tried to release Jesus. And he pleaded with the crowds to let him release Jesus. But they wouldn't let him. Until eventually he came forward and he washed his hands of, publicly of the blood of this man. Now a symbolic act like that would convey to all of his underlings that he has no interest in killing Jesus. Eventually he gives the go-ahead when they threaten that if he does not allow for Jesus to be crucified, then they would report him to Caesar. But if Pilate and his underlings or anyone could find a way to make this all look good, good for Pilate and at the same time not having to kill Jesus, then this of course is probably what they would do. And probably it is something like this that they did. The centurion at the foot of the cross, in fact, declared that this man is innocent, according to the Gospel of Luke. Even if this man is the Son of God, according to the Gospel of Mark. So he was already a Christian believer. Would he himself have an interest in killing Jesus? It seems then that there is nothing really in the Gospels that is historically dependable to prove that Jesus finally died. The Gospel according to John, to make this right, has it that Jesus was thrust in the side with a spear. But historians generally do not consider this to be a historically dependable event in the life of Jesus, or rather coming to the death of Jesus, because they think that John has actually had this wound inflicted in, the, in his record for theological purposes. In other words, the later the gospel, the more they want to prove that Jesus actually died. And John is just here simply providing the proof, even to the point of having to invent it. Notice also that in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the, the, the onset of the death of Jesus creates such a cosmic cataclysm. The earth shook and the bodies of the dead uh, rise to life and they eventually come into Jerusalem and appear to many people, uh, that no one would dare to, appear, to, to approach Jesus and thrust him in this particular way. So either he dies, uh, in the cataclysmic way that the synoptic gospels depict or in the calm manner in which the gospel according to John depicts which allows for somebody now to come and spear him in the side. I would take it that that is not historically reliable and finally I would say that from all of what I've discussed it seems quite clear that there's no clear evidence that Jesus actually rose from the dead. Uh, one might even uh, say that perhaps he survived the crucifixion. Thank you.
Remember in my uh, introductory speech, I mentioned five basic points that scholars generally agreed on when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And um, during the rebuttal period, uh, Shabir, I guess, will uh, address these. But if you notice, Shabir did not deny, as of yet, um, at least the first three, uh, or at least the first four points that I mentioned, basically the crucifixion, the honorable burial of Jesus, uh, the discovery of his empty tomb, and the post-mortem appearances, Shabir seemed to concede that these are historically reliable events. The only problem, of course, is the first part. Um, Shabir believes that Jesus was crucified, he was placed on the cross, uh, but he did not die on the cross. Now, this, of course, flies diametrically against the classical Islamic view, which has always maintained historically, that is, the traditional historical view, has been that according to Surah 4, Ayah 157, Jesus was neither crucified nor put to death. And so, uh, Shabir's view is more akin to that of the Ahmadiyya movement in Islam. And so I've always, I've said this to Shabir 15 years ago, we were good friends, that we're halfway home. He's got Jesus crucified, I just got to convince him that Jesus died, and we're almost there. So, we've got the crucifixion of Jesus, but the view that Shabir is espousing is actually a very old idea known as the swoon theory, also known as the apparent death theory. And this has been around, it's an old chestnut, it's been floating around for a long time. As far back as 1835, um, David, David uh, Strauss, who wrote the book Das Leben Jesu, The Life of Jesus, one of the first critical works on the life of Jesus in scholarship, he said, and he had no invested interest in the resurrection, he didn't believe it occurred, he didn't believe in the miracles of Jesus, he said there is no way that the saloon theory could fly, because this does not have enough explanatory power to explain the origin of Christianity. It has no way of explaining how Jesus went from a lowly Galilean prophet to the risen Lord who was worshipped in the Christian community, in the Christian church. There is absolutely no way someone could have just simply was rendered unconscious and became the exalted Lord of the church. This does not have enough explanatory power. This is actually not even, uh, unless you read fictional books like the Da Vinci Code and others where they propose such ideas, this is no longer uh, held by the majority of scholarship today. The other point I wanted to mention as well is that I appreciate that Shabir mentions that Surah 4, Ayah 157 is vague, and it is, because the Quran does mention the death of Jesus in Surah 3, Ayah 55, and Surah 19, Ayah 33. And various interpretations have arisen in light of the fact of the traditionalist view that Jesus was not crucified or put to death. But what I want to propose tonight is to consider the fact that in the Quran, in Surah 4, Ayah 155, and Surah 5, or, um, Surah 5, Ayah 70, it points out that previous prophets of Allah were sent to the people and many of them were persecuted and others were slain, they were put to death. Now, if Muslims do not make a difference among the prophets, if they make no distinction among the prophets of Allah, then why is it that Jesus gets out scot-free here? Why is it that other prophets were put to death, and yet Jesus had to escape this type of fate? It makes no sense, unless, of course, there is distinction among Jesus and the other prophets. The other point that has to be mentioned is that Shabir calls into question the gospel accounts that mention the death of Jesus. All of the gospel accounts maintain that when Jesus died on the cross, he committed his spirit into the Father's hand, and it clearly states that he gave up his spirit, which is a, a Semitic expression, to die, to expire, to give the spirit, to give up the ghost, means to die. And all of the Gospel accounts maintain this. We have multiple attestation on this point, also corroborated in the book of Acts and also by Paul. The question we have to ask tonight is, why is it that scholars do believe that Jesus died by crucifixion? And I submit to you tonight that the weight of evidence leans strongly in that direction. Shabir mentioned the Talmud. Yes, the Talmud does mention the third day. You should visit the tomb on the third day. This is based on the Jewish belief that the soul resides around the body until the third day, after which it enters into its final state. So that was based on a Jewish interpretation of the post-mortem status of the soul after physical death. But what he did not mention to you is that in the Talmud, in Sanhedrin 43a, we are told in the Babylonian Talmud about the death of Yeshua, of Jesus. It tells us that on the eve of Passover, they hung Yeshua. And that there was a cry sent out, if there was anyone to come and plead his case, come on forward and admit it. The Talmud admits 
that Jesus was crucified because he was a blasphemer, a sorcerer, and an idolater. And in fact, what was the charges brought against Jesus? Well, the religious establishment accused him of blasphemy. And the Romans saw his act, uh, or the claim to being a king, to be a treasonous statement. Now, Shabir says crucifixion was not meant to inflict pain, but shame. Well, I would submit that it was meant to inflict both of them. In fact, the Roman writer Seneca said that he preferred suicide to crucifixion. And that should immediately tell you that crucifixion is one of the most agonizing, uh, inhumane forms of torture and execution. And so even the Roman writers themselves would cringe at this idea. Now, Shabir also mentioned John 19, where it talks about the piercing of the side of Jesus. And he argues that uh, some scholars believe that this is not historical. Well, I would differ on that point, simply because if you read uh, John's Gospel, he is actually, he should actually be credited with accuracy here. In chapter 19 of John's Gospel and 32 and following, he first mentions a Roman practice, only he mentions this, of um, the breaking of the legs of the victims on the cross to hasten death. This is known as crudi fragium. And the reason why they did this was to hasten their death because it was against Jewish law to let bodies hang on the cross during the Sabbath. And as the Sabbath was drawing, the Romans broke the legs of the thieves on the cross. We have archaeological evidence uh, of crucified victims who've had their, their shins broken, etc. This was done by the Romans. Now, how is it that John got that right, but he didn't get the, the uh, piercing of Jesus right? Well, there was a first century Roman writer by the name of Quintilian, and he mentions the piercing of people, uh, not only who had been crucified, but uh, that it was also a form of Roman punishment. And he does mention, in one case, a particular event where a person who had been crucified was pierced through by their Roman antagonists. Thank you. <clears throat>
because they, they thought that uh, from the past experience, a person still has a certain degree of life in him uh, up, for, up to another couple of days. And of course, if you put the person into burial for a while, most people, even if they were just simply near dead, would eventually die. Um, but uh, the Talmud did mention that one case of this one particular person who was found alive. And from that, they prescribed a general rule saying you should visit the grave because it is possible that as that young man was found alive, you may find others alive as well. Uh, in, in general, we should say that Tony has put forward five that he calls indisputable uh, points. But uh, what Tony has missed is that these points that are generally agreed upon by scholars are agreed upon by different scholars. You would find from within the evangelical tradition and persons who are deeply committed to faith that will hold all of these, but not as historians, but as persons of faith. But when historians hold to one of these facts, they do not necessarily hold to the others. In fact, some of these are mutually exclusive, as I've explained before, but I'll make it more clear now. When a historian says that Jesus definitely died, if Robert Funk and, and others have said this, then uh, and, and they have said this, I'm not disputing that, they're saying this on the presupposition that he did not again appear to his disciples. The moment you say he appeared again to his disciples, we and they would be wondering, how do you know the person was dead in the first place? And they're wondering about this. So whereas uh, Tony quoted Gerd Ludeman as, as saying that the disciples had sightings, Gerd Ludeman is looking at it from the subjective point of view of the disciples. They saw something. He's not looking at it from the objective point of view that something definitely there was physically available or are somehow literally available to be seen by the disciples. This, for Gard Ludman and others, are the subjective sightings of the disciples that are not historically uh, reliable. So if we dispute any one of these facts, the whole thing seems to unravel. And if we dispute the fact that Jesus actually died on the cross at the time when the uh, gospel writers depict that he did die on the cross, then the, the, the entire series of five points become unraveled because this is the broken link that makes the entire chain uh, severed. And uh, we have good evidence, as I've pointed out, to show that there was some doubt uh, initially as to whether or not the disciples really um, uh, could verify that Jesus died. Uh, at the time when the Gospels say that he did. Certainly they do. But then th they do say that he did die on the cross. But notice that in Mark's Gospel, when the body of Jesus was requested for burial, Pilate was amazed that Jesus had died so soon. The other Gospels do not mention that doubt. But Raymond Brown notes that even though Mark, Matthew and Luke are dependent on Mark, they rewrite the story in their own gospel so as not to mention the fact that Pilate was amazed that Jesus died so soon. And according to Father Brown, the reason that they have so reworked the stories is so that their gospels could not produce the same sort of doubt that Mark's gospel was producing. In other words, if one reads Mark's gospel, one would be asking, well, wait a minute, maybe Pilate is right. How do you know he was dead so soon? And, and that would remain as an element of doubt. What would then verify the fact that he actually finally died? It couldn't be the spear thrust because that's not historical. It couldn't be the breaking of the legs because the right legs of the others were broken but not that of Jesus. Moreover, did the writers of the New Testament really know the details of what happened on that uh, very historic time? In fact, do they even know the date on which Jesus was crucified? According to the interpreter's Bible, uh, we have two different dates in the, in, in the Gospels. According to the Gospel of John, it was Nisan 14. According to the other Gospels, it was Nisan 15. Surely the Gospels don't give you that uh, precise date in terms of the month, month and date, but we know that from the way they have depicted. Either Jesus died before the Passover meal or after, and you cannot have it both ways. At the time of the death of Jesus is also not agreed upon in, in the various Gospels. We have the, in Mark that Jesus was crucified at the third hour, but in John's Gospel he was uh, still in Pilate's court at the sixth hour three hours later. Some have tried to harmonize this, but as far as the Raymond Brown has pointed out, uh, this, these harmonizations do not really work, and in the end we must say that the Gospel writers did not have any firm knowledge about the specifics of what really happened. So in short, we would argue that if Jesus again appeared to his disciples, that is because he was not dead in the first place, and if he was dead in the first place, he did not also appear to his disciples, and in short, there is no reason to believe that Jesus physically, bodily, rose from the dead. Thank you.
In my remaining time, uh, I'd like to just once again uh, recap on uh, where I started with uh, the five points. I want to submit once again that these five points are points that are generally agreed by New Testament scholars. The crucifixion of Jesus, his honorable burial, the discovery of the empty tomb, the post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the Christian way. Now, these are not all held by scholars of faith. That is not true at all. Uh, the crucifixion of Jesus is accepted uh, very unanimously by a number of scholars. His honorable burial is accepted. Gerd Ludemann accepts that as a historical event, and Ludemann is no conservative scholar. The postmortem appearances, again, Gerd Ludemann points out that it can be taken as historically certain that the disciples and Peter did indeed have postmortem appearances, experiences of postmortem appearances where Jesus appeared to them. I am not saying that uh, the disciples um, uh, were hallucinating here at all. Uh, this was not a hallucination um, uh, situation because when Jesus did appear, he appeared to sets of people. At one time, Paul records that he appeared to 500 brethren at once. It's quite, uh, it would be quite odd to have 500 people hallucinating the same thing at the same time. I can grant that to individual subjective experiences, but not 500 people or a group of 11 disciples. Um, his, uh, uh, the empty tomb, the postmortem appearances, uh, the origin of the Christian way, these are things that are unanimously agreed upon. The reason we have to ask tonight why Shabir rejects these points is, I think, quite clear. What is the criterion that Shabir is utilizing? It is not uh, the historical critical method. I think the point that is coloring Shabir's lenses here is, again, the Quran. He has to uh, deny uh, the death of Jesus simply because the Quran denies it. That's the criterion that he is following tonight, not the historical critical method that scholars generally uh, follow. The other point is that all of the Gospels agree unanimously. There's independent attestation that when Jesus um, gave up his spirit, he died. That is the unanimous consent. And Shabir mentions the, the fact that in Mark 15, uh, when Jesus dies and the report is uh, given to Pilate, that Pilate is surprised that Jesus is dead and that he had died so soon or so quickly than what is generally accepted. But the passage goes on to mention that Pilate asked the centurion to confirm whether he was dead or not. And only after his death was confirmed by the centurion did he allow the body to be given into the care of Joseph Arimathea for burial. So the fact is that what Mark is anticipating is precisely the very question that Shabir has raised tonight. Is there a doubt that Jesus was alive? And so he points out that the centurion confirmed the death of Jesus, if you will. He gave the death certificate, if you will, and confirmed it to Pilate, who in turn allowed him to take the body into his care. Now the question about the Passover and whether Jesus died on, on, on uh, the Passover, uh, whether he had the Passover the night before, etc. Th this is an uh, issue that deals with the fourth gospel and its relationship to the synoptics. Um, these are not irreconcilable at all. In fact, uh, the fourth gospel uh, is following, many scholars believe that John is following a different uh, time, a, a reckoning of time than the synoptics are following. The, John is following a Roman uh, set of, of, of chronology and timing, whereas the synoptics follow the Jewish uh, reckoning of time. There's another thing we should also realize, and that is whenever the gospels do speak about the Passover, they not only spoke about the Passover feast proper, but that the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was a, uh, a seven-day feast that followed the Passover, was also, by the first century, included in the Passover celebration, and it was given the term the Passover. In other words, the Passover came to include two feasts in one. And so it's quite possible that when it speaks about Jesus uh, dying during the Passover, the writer of the fourth gospel was intending to mean the whole feast inclusively. Now I want to end with this, and that is that the reason why I'm testifying to you tonight about all of this is not uh, because I'm trying to finish my PhD dissertation, but because I want to share with you that I met the living Christ. In my teens, I, I was raised in a very religious home, but I never had any sense of peace with God. I always had the sense that God was a judgment of God, a terrible God, a God who would punish me for my sins. And I was once challenged to take up the New Testament and to read it. And I can admit to you tonight, when I read the words of Jesus, his words were arresting. They were magnetic. I was attracted to his person 
and he changed my life. And I believe that he can do the same for you tonight. Thank you. Very good again, Tony. As we um, did last night, there has been never a dull moment. We've both been taking notes and responding specifically to what each other has said. So this makes it all exciting and a very memorable and uh, very important learning experience for all of us. Uh, Tony has asked uh, what colors uh, Shabir's lens is. And I must say that uh, if, if I take the position of a Quran believer, then I believe in Jesus and I believe that he was the true Messiah of God. If I put away the Quran for a moment and, and do not pay any attention to what the Quran is saying, then I don't believe in Jesus. Now I must ask, what reasons are there for believing in Jesus? Now when we look back at the first century Jewish belief concerning the Messiah, uh, a dead Messiah is a false Messiah. And if the Jews are boasting in the Talmud that they killed Jesus, they are boasting in essence that Jesus was the false Messiah. And this is the Quran's point against them, that while they're making this boast, they're very wrong. Jesus is the true Messiah. So you see my delicate position. If I believe in the Quran, I believe that Jesus is the true Messiah. If I don't believe in the Quran, I would have to believe, based on everything I know, that Jesus was the false Messiah. Uh, but of course, I do believe in the Quran, and I believe that Jesus was the true Messiah of God. But I was prepared tonight for the purpose of this academic discourse to suspend my belief in the Quran. I have asked what possibility is there that um, a, a, there could be an interpretation that is harmonizable with the Quran, and I have found one. I have found a, an interpretation that is possible. Uh, to, it is possible for Muslims to say that uh, Jesus on whom be peace was put on the cross, but he didn't actually die on the cross and that the Quran is merely denying that he died on the, uh, on the cross uh, as a result of his enemies having the upper hand on him. But in some mysterious way, God raised him and, uh, and rescued him and raised him to himself. The details of this are not told in the Quran, and it's not necessary for Muslims to believe in any one particular detailed interpretation. But here is an interpretation that I believe is harmonizable with the Quran and with whatever is known from the New Testament Gospels and from history. But I have not allowed that uh, interpretation to color my discussion tonight. Uh, the uh, topic before us has an affirmative and a negative position. Tony taking the affirmative position has to prove that Jesus rose from the dead. And to prove that he has to prove that Jesus died in the first place. If we merely deny that Jesus died in the first place, and if we show sufficient evidence uh, that there was some doubt as to whether Jesus actually died, well then we have thrown the entire resurrection hypothesis into question. More than this, in fact, so we are showing that there is more than doubt. There has been attempts to cover up the initial doubt that was there. It seems as though it was quite clear from the beginning that there was no evidence that Jesus died on the cross at the time when the New Testament Gospels are saying that he died. And the later the Gospel, the more they have gone out of their way to try and remove that doubt and to try and give us the final nail in the coffin or the spear in the side that will convince everyone that Jesus actually died on the cross. Because that is the only thing that will help us to think of a resurrection from the dead as opposed to the resuscitation of a person who had just simply been in a deep sleep or in a coma. Now, I have said that various scholars affirm various items of Tony's um, uh, hypothesis, but not all of them. And he actually brought into view the, the fact that Gord Ludeman uh, is speaking about a, a kind of hallucination that the apostles went through. So you can hardly cite Gord Ludeman, as Tony did, as a proof that the disciples had this view of, of Jesus after he died. He was speaking about a subjective experience, not about objective reality. What about the difference between the Gospels about the date of Jesus' crucifixion? Uh, Scott McKnight, in his book, Jesus and His Death, uh, has actually discussed the point that Tony raised about the Dead Sea Scrolls and about the possibility that various uh, writers were following different chronologies, and he has discounted that. Finally, he has taken the view that the Gospel according to John is right on the chronology and that the Synoptic Gospels are wrong. Uh, another scholar, William Barclay, in his daily Bible commentary, looking at this, he has taken the opposite view, that uh, John has the wrong chronology here and that the synoptics are correct, but he makes an important statement that I read from you from page 293 of the second volume on his commentary to John's Gospel. There is here a contradiction for which there is no compromise solution. Either the synoptic Gospels are correct or John is. And uh, I rest my case on this in saying that uh, there is no firm evidence that Jesus actually died on, on the cross. 
And uh, the, there is, on the, on the contrary, uh, much reason to doubt that he actually died on the cross, especially since there are reports that he actually appeared to his disciples later on. And this means, in essence, that we have no proof that Jesus actually rose from the dead, but every reason to believe uh, that uh, he was the prophet and messenger of God. If I believe in the Quran, I believe in Jesus as the true Messiah of God. And if I suspend that belief, then I would have to conclude he's the false Messiah, but I hold on to my belief in the Quran. Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Atik, and uh, um, I probably this hall is too cold for me, so I missed some part of your speech. The first thing is that I just wonder where, where the Jesus is now, like after resurrection, where he has gone. Is he still present on this world? This is my question actually to both of you. You can respond. And second of all, they, the, the title also says, the, Who is the last prophet? As the, the Christianity believes that there are a cascade of prophets before Jesus. So is there any prophet after Jesus as well? And, and why actually the religion compels people actually to believe on mysteries while the modern man is trying to find out the minute and little detail about a single cell at molecular level and human beings are made of at least trillions of cells and still like we are confused about immaculate conceptions and about the resurrections so would you please both answer on this issue thank you very much oh, is my mic on yeah okay those were actually three questions and uh, if i can ask the moderators to to ask everyone to limit themselves to one question at a time they can come back for a second and a third uh, after having rejoined the line if there is one but uh, i think one question is enough to uh, devote two minutes to uh, especially the first question i believe is important and i'm glad you asked it because tony uh, has mentioned the ahmadiyya belief it is the ahmadiyya belief that uh, jesus after having survived the cross actually walked all his way to Kashmir and eventually he died and he was buried and, and remains buried in Kashmir. Uh, Sunni Muslims do not believe that and this is where I depart from the Ahmadiyya belief and I maintain the Sunni belief. Uh, there has been verses of the Quran. Uh, there have been uh, scholars who, um, among early Muslims who have said that uh, there are certain verses which seem to indicate that Jesus died. But the term that was used is uh, uh, tawufiya, and that, verse, that word is uh, ambiguous uh, because technically it doesn't mean death, but it is used generally to depict death. Uh, so God says to Jesus, Inni mutawafika wa I'm going to cause you to die or I'm going to gather you and take you up and, and raise you to myself. So Muslims believe that God uh, somehow took Jesus, cutting short his ministry, and raised him up to himself. So Muslims believe that generally that God uh, keeps Jesus alive in heaven and that before the end of time Jesus will make another uh, sojourn here on earth. And that of course makes it different uh, from the uh, belief of the Ahmadiyyas who believe that he physically uh, now came down from the cross, uh, eventually taken down by people who were sympathetic to his cause, given uh, a, a recent uh, a, a, a very good burial, if you can call it a burial, in a way to try and preserve his body, and that eventually he survived, he uh, recovered, and he walked all, his, all of his way to Kashmir where he died and remains buried. But Muslims in thinking that God preserves Jesus, and uh, is, uh, do not hear, uh, subscribe to something that is uh, um, fantastic because in, in, in the belief systems of both Muslims and Christians it is possible that God, mighty as it is, can do what he intends to do such as preserve a person and keep that person alive. Okay. Am I on? Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with Jabir. We should try to limit one question per person because uh, it, we just took up two minutes to try to answer that. So in, in my response, the, the, the Christian response is, is quite simple. Uh, Christians, uh, the Gospels tell us, and the Book of Acts tells us that uh, following the uh, resurrection of Jesus, uh, Jesus uh, appeared to his disciples, according to Luke. Uh, Jesus appeared for a period of 40 days in which he taught them, in which he instructed them on their mission and what they were going to do in his absence, when he would leave them, when he would depart from them. And so for the Christian, you don't only have the resurrection, which is an important, uh, the most important aspect of the Christian faith, you also have what we call the ascension. Christians believe in the ascension of Jesus uh, into heaven, at which time he departed. Uh, he sent the Holy Spirit, 
to energize the church, to commission the church to do the work of announcing the gospel, which is the good news about Jesus, his death, his burial, his resurrection. And in the interim, the one thing that the, the, uh, the church is awaiting is the parousia, the coming of Jesus, which is clearly described in the New Testament. There's great detail about what he will do. Uh, the Quran, of course, doesn't mention that, but the Hadith does. Yeah, this question is directed to Mr. Tony. Today, most of the Christian doctrine are based on what Paul said. And during the course of your lecture, you were making references to Paul. Paul said this in a letter written by Paul, so on and so forth. But is it not funny that this same Paul, who was called Saul during the time of Jesus, he was never a disciple of Jesus. He was even persecutor of Christians then. He never lived with Jesus in any time. But suddenly overnight, the guy became Christian and started writing a lot of things about Jesus. Meanwhile, all the disciples of Jesus, they wrote little concerning Jesus. Thank you. Question. Uh, in response to that, uh, the very argument that Saul of Tarsus became a follower of Jesus, uh, I think supports the point that I made earlier. What was it that caused this rabid persecutor of the early Christian movement to become one of them? And the only reason that he gives us is because he met the risen Christ. Now, you're absolutely right that Paul was not part of the original 12. He was not uh, part of the original disciples that walked with Jesus. Scholars believe that he may have heard of Jesus uh, during his earthly ministry. He may have seen him. We're not sure about that. That, uh, that remains speculative. But the fact of the matter is that the presumption in the question is that somehow uh, Paul, was a, Paul was a deviant or that Paul went off track and, and taught something different than what Jesus did. There's a, a wonderful book written by David Winham entitled Paul, Founder or Follower of Christ. And uh, he goes into great detail to show that Paul, uh, in, in, in contrast to what many uh, people believe today, particularly in Islam, that Paul was really the founder of Christianity, that he, was, uh, that he was in conflict with what Jesus taught, what he shows is that Paul was in sync with what Jesus taught. Uh, Paul was given the special mission of being the apostle to the Gentiles, those who were not Jews. And he communicated the gospel to them in ways that they can understand. And the Apostle Paul, it's important to note that when you, write, when you read his letters, what you notice is that in many occasions, Paul quotes from material that he obtained from the first disciples of Jesus. He uses the formula, I received and I have passed on to you that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised again. There are many creeds in the Pauline letters that are clearly from the Aramaic speaking church. The prayer of Maranatha in 1 Corinthians 16 verse 22, he gets that from the early Christian movement. And he quotes Jesus many times. He says this is what the Lord said in the night in which he was betrayed. He took bread and he broke it and he gave it. So Paul is not the adversary that you think he is. He was a faithful disciple of Jesus of Nazareth. book uh, I've read but I'm not convinced by it. I see that David Wenham is actually avoiding the crucial issues uh, that really decides this question. He focuses on uh, what he himself has labeled uh, as parallelomania, but he didn't think he was falling into that. Uh, he thought that it's enough to show that something was said by Jesus, something is said by Paul, and there's some similarity between the two that was said. But his very exercise shows that there's greater dissimilarity between the writings of Paul and the quoted speeches of Jesus, especially in the Synoptic Gospels. Sometimes there seems to be harmony, but in that harmony was later imposed. As, for example, Paul saying that on the night of the betrayal Jesus said do this in remembrance of me this is also found in Luke's gospel but it's thought by scholars now to be a later insertion into Luke's gospel because it is lacking in some very important uh, early manuscripts of Luke in short it seems that Paul taught many things which were quite new which he didn't get from the disciples of Jesus and which they themselves opposed as we can see for example in the gospel in, in the letter uh, of James Hey there. Uh, my, co my question is uh, for Shabir Ali. Um, and 
I was wondering um, if you think, uh, well, this is a, a multiple choice answer, or multiple choice question, so uh, I'm going to list it off. All right. Uh, it'll be quick, sorry. Does the Quranic doctrine of abrogation, that is the uh, divinely sanctioned rewriting and nullification of previously given and divinely given scriptures, in your mind call into question the earlier accounts of Jesus, the events themselves, or Quranic authenticity in the light of human reason? <laughs> I, I missed the, the last part of it. What are the choices? Does it call into question the, the earlier accounts of Jesus? Yes. The events themselves as they really occurred beyond anybody's account of them, mm -hmm. or the Quranic authenticity itself um, in the light of human reason. Uh, isn't your question rhetorical then? I mean, well, what are the choices here? Okay, I'll try to address it nevertheless. Um, the, the Quran's doctrine of abrogation has been much misunderstood by mo both Muslims and others. Muslim scholars generally took the doctrine uh, to mean that there, there would be certain um, instructions given in the Quran at once uh, and then later on uh, superseded by later revelation. Uh, so such that there is a change on the prescription uh, on, regarding some of the practices and legal codes of, of the Muslim faith. Uh, but they all have agreed that this does not supersede, or our later revelation would not supersede actual facts of history, uh, or passages dealing with theology, or nor would it uh, supersede anything uh, that, that is known to be a definitive sort of uh, revelation. Uh, they, they were only speaking about uh, legal issues, uh, practice and, and legal codes. Um, it, nowadays, many scholars uh, feel that that doctrine has been overstated, and even with regards to legal codes and, and practices, uh, we should think of later verses as more specifying or adding more details and information to what was already given, not so as to cancel whatever previously was given uh, by a, a specific revelation from God. But the short answer to your question would be that the Quran, uh, by the doctrine of uh, abrogation, uh, would not supersede anything that is known from history or anything that was definitively revealed in a previous uh, scripture. Uh, however, the Quran's denial of what is being stated in the Gospels with regards to the crucifixion of Jesus uh, would be a denial of what from the Quranic perspective was not originally a revelation from God, but things that were written by people, given perhaps the best knowledge that they had, uh, but perhaps not necessarily the actual facts of history that they were recording. Thank you. The, the questions seem to be very, I guess, oriented towards, uh, towards Shabir, but uh, all I could say is that uh, Shabir has articulated what is the concept of abrogation within Islam, and, and of course the, the Quran is clear on, on how uh, certain revelations that come later supersede those that, uh, that come before. Um, what I would say, if I can just take the time to comment on, on Surah 4, uh, 157, is, is that again, uh, this is a very vague passage in the Quran. And, and that is why it has, uh, uh, it has resulted in so many uh, different interpretations. Some think it was Judas Iscariot who was put on the cross, same, some think it was a Roman soldier, some think it was a rabbi, etc. Um, but the, 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 f the fact of the matter still remains, uh, I think, that uh, the, the death of Jesus still rests on, on good historical grounds. My question is uh, to Tony. And uh, uh, the question is that I am Muslim by faith, and uh, I have uh, read the Quran, and I have the knowledge about some scholars. They say that uh, I am, uh, get satisfied about the thing that God has created the creature with soil, with fire, as well as from man to man, man to, uh, man gave birth, Adam gave birth to Hawa, and also man and woman relation got this thing. So uh, I am, uh, I'm not satisfied when you say that uh, Jesus is the son of God. So my belief is if God has created everything in every way and he, say, he says that I can do everything, then how could it be possible for God that he cannot create from Maryam and the Jesus son? This is my question. Thank you. Appreciate your question. Uh, well, we have to define what Christians mean by son. Uh, in the Quran, the 
reading in the Quran maintains that how can God have a son seeing that he has no consort? Now that statement is just as blasphemous to the Muslim as it is to the Christian. No Christian believes that God engaged in any form of, of human relations with Mary, the mother of Jesus, to bring forth Jesus. Uh, Christians believe that Jesus is the eternal son of God. In other words, the terms father, son, are relational terms, terms that we believe have been part and parcel of the Godhead. In other words, Jesus stands in the eternal relationship with God as father and son. And so when we speak of son, we're not talking about a son that is generated the way human beings procreate children. So, for example, when the Quran talks about a traveler as Ibn Sabil, uh, a son of the road, that is not meaning that the road begets people. All it means is that he is a traveler. Uh, when Jesus talks about uh, his opponents being uh, children of the devil, obviously he's not saying that Satan uh, spawns or generates children, but that metaphorically they follow in his course and in his path. And so I think one of the great misunderstandings in, in, uh, among Muslims and Christians is that we fail to understand what we mean by our terms. And that is why it's important for us to define our terms. What do we mean by son? We certainly don't mean that God needed a wife or a consort to bring about Jesus. Christians also refer to Jesus not only as son of God, which I mentioned yesterday at Waterloo was part of the consciousness of the historical Jesus, that he was the beloved son, but also he's known as the word of God. Muslims speak of the kalimatullah, the word of God. But to Christians, this word was the son, the one who became the man Jesus. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so as one Muslim author put it, whereas the word becomes a book in Islam, the eternal word of God becomes a book, in Christianity this eternal word becomes a human being. Yeah, I think Tony's answer highlights the fact that uh, sometimes uh, people uh, misunderstand the importance of the virgin birth of Jesus. That by itself does not prove that Jesus was the divine son of God, because if he were the divine son of God, he would have been such from all eternity. Uh, it also highlights the importance of defining our terms, because if uh, Tony uh, is, is now willing to define uh, the term son of God as uh, being uh, metaphorical, uh, well then, Muslims and Christians might have had uh, very little of difference on this point. I think the, the real issue has been is that Tony himself, um, after having reached that definition, goes back into using it in, in a literal sense, to say that Jesus is literally the Son of God. But if Jesus was literally the Son of God from all eternity, um, we should ask, why this term Son of God? Why not brother? If, if they are so co-equal from the very beginning, so that one was not actually born from the other, well then should Shouldn't they be brothers, or perhaps sisters, or perhaps two parents uh, of the entire world? Why father and son? Does that not imply one greater, one lesser? Um, hello. Um, my question is for Dr. Ali. Um, I wondered what your opinion was on um, Jesus um, in the Gospels uh, prophesying his own death. Um, especially in the Gospel of Mark, where uh, you say uh, doubt is uh, shedded on uh, Jesus' death. Um, in Mark chapter 9, verse 31, it says, For he taught his disciples and said to them, The Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. I wondered uh, what your opinion on those verses was. Yes. I don't have the doctor title yet, but I appreciate the compliment. Thank you very much. Um, many scholars have studied this, in fact. They have asked uh, whether the passion predictions uh, that are reported in the Synoptic Gospels could really be credited to the historical Jesus. And uh, many think that, in fact, they were written after the event, that uh, Jesus came and he lived and uh, everyone knew he was crucified. Now the Gospel writers are writing, and they're writing based on what they already knew to have happened, and they're reconstructing the life of Jesus in the light of what now they believed uh, on account of faith. And so they're thinking if Jesus was crucified, certainly he knew it ahead of time, and he must have predicted it so. Other scholars take a more conservative approach, such as the approach of uh, Father Raymond Brown in his two-volume work, The Death of the Messiah, which I referred to previously. In the appendix uh, to that two-volume work, he um, deals with this specific question. He analyzes these uh, uh, passion predictions. 
there are three of them, and uh, he uh, thinks that Jesus certainly, as a human being living at that time as an intelligent person, marching into Jerusalem, challenging the authorities as he did, he must have known that they would come after him. Uh, you don't challenge the authorities and get away scot free. And he must have known the kinds of methods that they use for killing people at that time, and who might be the chief protagonists uh, who would be out to get him. And so he might have said something uh, that would take into consideration this human knowledge that was commonly available. Uh, the he and others have also seen that even these passion predictions, uh, as can be traced from one gospel to another, have evolved. Where the later gospels, such as Matthew, gives a more specific uh, narrative saying that Jesus said that he was going to be crucified. Whereas in Mark's gospel, on one occasion, it just simply says that he would be killed. Uh, and, and you can see the e evolution in the story. So these by themselves do not prove that Jesus had divine foreknowledge of the event, but he must have had just some simple human knowledge as we might have had uh, in that circumstance as well. Uh, in regards to uh, Dr. Raymond Brown, who is, uh, who is now deceased, uh, but was a notable scholar, uh, Dr. Brown did believe in, in the death of Jesus. Uh, he wrote the book, The Death of the Messiah, two volumes, but uh, he himself believed that uh, Jesus died. Uh, in Mark's Gospel, you have another prediction. In, in Mark 10.45, Jesus makes a statement that the Son of Man has not come to uh, be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And the other point we should remember about the Gospel of Mark is that according to Rudolf Pesch, who was a, uh, who was a Markan specialist, Dr. Pesch points out that uh, Mark's Gospel, before the Markan Gospel was composed, there was a pre-Markan pre passion narrative which composed of chapters 14 to 16. And within that, uh, those chapters, you have material that goes back to 37 of the Common Era, within five years of Jesus' death. And included within that is the Last Supper account, where Jesus did predict uh, when he took the cup that that cup would represent uh, the blood, the blood of the new covenant that he would shed uh, for many for the remission of sins. So scholars generally agree that Jesus knew that his, uh, his fate would have ended in death in Jerusalem. Hello. Hi, my, my question is very simple. Is uh, What is the concept of repentance and salvation in Christianity? Thank you. The concept of repentance and salvation in Christianity. Well, the word repentance uh, comes from the Greek word metanoia. It's a very, uh, a very pregnant word. And metanoia means to change the mind, to have a change of mind. And the concept of repentance, of course, means to turn away from sin. The Hebrew word is teshuva, which means to return, to come back to God to turn away from your sins and return to God. Salvation in the Christian context uh, is based on two main ingredients. Uh, Paul in his letter to the Romans in chapter 10 verse 9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And this is interesting because the two necessary components is confession that Jesus is Lord but also belief in his resurrection from the dead which also entails his, uh, his atonement by death on the cross. Resurrection is, is, is meaningless without death, of course. Um, and so salvation entails calling, uh, trusting on this Messiah, this Savior that God sent. The concept of atonement is very important, not only in Christianity, but also Judaism. The whole concept of atonement rests on the sacrificial system that we find permeated throughout the Old Testament. You find it even before the time of Musa, of Moses. You find it, for instance, in the book of Genesis with Abel offering up the, 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 the uh, uh, lamb from his flock. You find it uh, following the flood. Noah offers up sacrifice to God, etc. So, and then we have Abraham as well in Genesis 15. So the idea of, of repentance and, and salvation go hand in hand. The, the, the preaching of John the Baptist, Yahya, it was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The message of Jesus was repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And so repentance and, and salvation are, are corollaries uh, of the same thing. We need to repent, but we also need to, according to the New Testament, put our trust in the one that God sent. Uh, trust in him as our substitute, the one who bore our penalties on himself and, and, and gave us liberty. There's an interesting book by Bilby and Eddy uh, on the nature of the atonement, Four Views, which is a compilation of, the debate, uh, of a debate that took place among evangelical scholars. 
And many of these scholars now, in fact, are asking whether uh, it, it is uh, really right to say that Jesus died as a penalty for our sins, because uh, it, it seems to run contrary to the overarching teaching in the Bible about repentance and God's forgiveness. Because if you're to repent and, and God forgives you, then what's the sense of having someone else pay for your sins? Because if someone else pays for your sins, then as Gregory Boyd asks, does God really forgive in that case? Um, because if God gets his kill anyhow, this is, I mean, the way he's putting it, then in what sense does he really forgive? Uh, the Gospel according to Luke in chapter 15 tells us a story about the prodigal son uh, who was forgiven by his father just simply by returning to the father. Uh, and, and the story quite clearly teaches that when you really are repentant, as Tony had explained about metanoia, then God simply forgives you. Imam Ali, I hope that's appropriate. Do you believe Jesus had a purpose? Question the title Imam, but nevertheless, that's what I'm commonly called in such public uh, forums. Uh, well, uh, what Jesus, uh, from, from the Quranic perspective, um, uh, there's nothing in the Quran that, de that depicts anything negative about Jesus. And in the Islamic tradition, uh, there, there is a story about prophets uh, coming before God on the Day of Judgment and each one remembering something that they did wrong. Uh, and uh, when it comes to the time to describe Jesus' um, part in the story, it doesn't say that Jesus did anything wrong. So there's nothing in the Islamic tradition that would make uh, Muslims think that Jesus uh, committed any sin or did anything wrong. Uh, in general, however, Muslims regard Jesus as a human person, and uh, the Bible says that he was uh, in every way like us apart from sin, which of course would mean that he wasn't really like us, because to be like us it means that we're prone to sin. That's the very a natural part of the human um, uh, nature. Uh, interestingly, in the Gospel according to John, there is a passage which um, has Jesus saying that he's not going up to Jerusalem yet. Um, and then uh, he eventually goes. But some of the scribes tried to change that to remove the word yet, so that it just simply says, well, sorry, he said, I'm not going up to Jerusalem. And then he later on goes secretly. But some of the scribes inserted the word yet, so that he is, in effect he says, I'm not yet going, allowing for him to later on go, and he does not contradict himself. Uh, so if, if you were to go by that, Muslims would want to wonder if Jesus sometimes and did not tell it exactly as, as it is. But of course, Tony would have a, an explanation for that passage in John's Gospel in chapter 7, and, and I would like to hear that. But in short, Muslims do not believe that Jesus uh, in, in any way contravened God's law, but as a human being, he must have, like the rest of us, committed some small mistakes of, of judgment. This would be, however, a presumption and, and nothing taught in our um, uh, sacred scriptures, definitely. Well, just to, to recap, uh, the, the, the New Testament is very clear that Jesus was holy, blameless, uh, separate from sinners. And, uh, of course, I wouldn't take John 7 as a problematic passage. I don't think that Jesus was lying at all. Uh, I think that uh, it's quite clear that his brothers didn't believe in him. They went ahead of him, uh, and then he went afterwards. I don't think that necessarily shows that Jesus was being deceptive. Uh, the Quran itself points out that Jesus was faultless. There's a, a saying in the Hadith that uh, all people have been touched by Satan except Jesus. And another Hadith says except Jesus and his mother. Um, but what I would say according to the per uh, about the purpose of Jesus is that Jesus came for several reasons. He came to give his life as a ransom for many. Uh, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus said that God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but that through him the world may be saved. And so that's the good news, is that in Christianity, God does the most majestic thing. God sends his own son to us, his very word, who comes to us and dies in our place to redeem us. According to Muslim religion, God has taken the responsibility of all the words of Quran that uh, it can never be changed till the end of the world. It means Muslims take it as a reference book. It, and uh, I have a question with you that what do you say about Bible? When you take it as a reference book, so do you have some guarantee about that? Because we will believe that we have the guarantee by the God that. Right. Well, I think it's important for us to stress as Muslims and Christians that we have to avoid the, the fallacy of equivocation, where we assume that when we use the same word, we mean the same thing. 
in the Quranic concept of inspiration of scripture, the belief is that is that what is in the Quran came down, tanzil, came down from Allah. Allah uh, revealed it, it came down through the, the, the agency of, of Jibreel to Muhammad. The Christian conception of inspiration is different than that. Uh, we believe that God moved men to speak uh, by the Holy Spirit, and we don't mean the angel Gabriel by that. By his Holy Spirit, God led men to write what he wanted them to write. This was not to say that uh, the experience of these writers would not enter into the text. They certainly do. Their experience enters into there. Their persona enters into the text. But our view is not that it just plopped down, that it just came down, but that God's Spirit moved them, that they utilized words and terms that were known in their own culture. And uh, Christians do believe in the infallibility of their scriptures. They do believe in the inerrancy of scripture. Uh, and of course, people will object and say, well, there are variants in the Bible. Well, Dr. Bruce Metzger has actually shown, and, and other uh, textual critics have shown, that the New Testament that we have today is over 99% pure to its original. And what I would say as well, and I know this is very controversial within Islam, is that there are Western scholars who have studied the Quran and uh, textual critics of the Quran who have also shown that prior to the Uthmanic recension, the standardization of the Quran, the Quran did have different readings. There were differing readings in the codices in the empire, in Basra and Damascus, and that Uthman called for the standardization of the Quran, and he burned all the other copies that were available, like that of Ibn Masood and Ubay bin Kab. And so uh, scholars like Arthur Jeffrey and others have shown that there were real variants in the copies of those Qurans prior to the standardization by Uthman. Of course, um, Arthur Jeffrey has not uh, shown that any Muslim over time has tried to corrupt the Quran to prove a different sort of theology. Whereas, of course, uh, Bruce Metzger has shown precisely this in the case of the Bible in his book, The New Testament, Its Transmission, Corruption and Restoration. And what he would mean by the New Testament being 99% pure, if that's precisely what he said, uh, would be that uh, as best as we can reconstruct the text, we have a wide variety of manuscripts from which we can reconstruct a text and, and we can have confidence that this is very close to what the original writers wrote. But to an extent, Metzger himself will complain about the ending of Mark's Gospel. We really don't know how Mark's Gospel originally ended and the ending we now have in Mark chapter 16 verses 12 to 20 are really uh, inserted en uh, an inserted ending by someone else. On the other hand, those variants which uh, existed prior to the Uthmanic manuscript might be explained by Muslims as falling within the concept of the sabat e for the seven ways in which the Quran has been revealed to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in which case there is more than one authentic ways of reciting the Quran and Uthman's work was was to compile a written text, a singular written text, that will aid the reciters uh, to stay away from the possible uh, misadventures of the human pen as they wrote things down in a variety of manuscripts, some of which could have mistakes due to human error. Thank you very, very much, both of you, for your presentation tonight. Uh, the tr issue of the Trinity came up and the biblical understanding of it as God apart from creation in love with himself, in a relational being between the Father and the Son specifically. I was wondering, Shabir, if you could speak to the Quranic understanding of God apart from his creation, what he was doing prior to creation in terms of love, um, if he had nothing in himself to relate to. You know, it's a classical answer to that question. It's a funny story. <laughs> you know, it, uh, <laughs> what was God doing prior to the creation? He was busy making hell for people who ask questions like that. Anyway, no, that's not my answer. <laughs> Anyhow, um, I have to say, I, I don't know what God was doing, but Muslim philosophers have thought about this question. I haven't studied the, the Muslim philosophy on this question. Uh, but to, to say that the answer is that God was, um, you know, uh, three beings and, and the three of them had love flowing among themselves and, and that proves that God is love. I don't know if that really answers the, the point because that would still mean that God was in love with himself because the, the being of God somehow, you know, if you have three minds and the three minds are in love with each other, well then that's still God's mind made up of the three minds. Uh, so I don't know if that really uh, does anything for, for the theory, but some people have advanced this as, uh, as something that supports the idea that God is three in one and perhaps Tony will say more about that. 
Well, uh, Shabir quoted my fa one of my favorite theologians, and that quote actually comes from St. Augustine. And it's St. Augustine who actually addresses the very question that you have raised. He actually is the one on his work, uh, De Trinitas, on the Trinity. He deals with this very question that you raised. And, uh, uh, and when he asks that particular question, it's about those who are, are asking the question of, of causal relations. And as you know, Augustine was, was a deep thinker as well. Um, that's a, an excellent question, uh, because one of the statements in the Bible is that God is love, that God is love. But not only that God is love, but that, is he, that he's eternally loving. Now, the question that we have to ask is, in the Islamic perspective, is God eternally loving? Has God been always eternally loving? Well, the answer has to be that, no, prior to creation, prior to the creation of anything, what was Allah loving? There was no subject-object relationship. If Allah is alone, what is there to love? But in the Christian conception of the Trinity, there is an eternal relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, where you have the Father in eternal relationship of love to the Son. And that's why in the New Testament, Jesus speaks of himself as the beloved Son of God. Um, I've heard a considerable amount of ambiguity in your talking about whether Jesus is either divine or if he's a, a human like us, and like your standpoint on that. C certainly. I believe that Jesus is the divine Son of God, and because we're dealing with the resurrection today, uh, we were dealing primarily uh, in that area. But the idea of Jesus being the Son of God, the divine Son of God, again, uh, is a relational term. Uh, Christians have always understood this to be relational. And we do understand the divinity of Jesus uh, as the Son of God primarily in the Pauline letters, the earliest letters of the New Testament, where he speaks of Jesus as the pre-existent Son who was sent into the world. God sent forth his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. You find this Christology also in the Gospel of John, uh, where Jesus uh, in, in the prologue of John is referred to as the Word who was with God in the beginning and who was God and through whom all things were made and that this Word became flesh. So I do believe that Jesus is the divine Son of God. I do believe that Jesus had this filial consciousness. Um, he speaks of himself as the Son, and if you look at Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, in one of his parables, the parable of the wicked tenants of the vineyard, he gives this story where uh, the owner of the vineyard, who is God, sends his servants, his slaves, into the vineyard to collect uh, the, the rent, if you will, and these, ser <clears throat> these slaves or servants are the prophets. And then finally, he sends his son. They mistreat the servants, they kill the servants, and then finally, at the end, last of all, he sends them his son. And, uh, of course, what Jesus is predicting through this parable is that his fate will be the same as of the prophets who came before him, that they would also treat, mistreat him as well. So uh, the idea that Jesus is Son of God is not an adoptionistic view, uh, which was considered heretical by the early church. We don't believe that God adopted Jesus as his Son. Uh, we believe, rather, that um, Jesus is the eternal Son of God who was sent into the world. In Philippians 2, 5 to 11, Paul quotes a very uh, a, a hymn that is considered by many scholars to be pre-Pauline. And in this hymn, he talks about the pre-existence of Jesus and his coming into the world, his incarnation, and his death, and his subsequent exaltation. Well, I think the question is right in, in noting that there's a certain degree of ambiguity and equivocation in, in the, the term Jesus and in the term Son of God even. If we say that Son of God means literally Son of God and we should stick to that throughout, the passage in Mark's Gospel does not necessarily have to be interpreted as meaning that Jesus is literally the Son of God. Why not metaphorically? Just to depict that God really loves this particular person. Many passages of the Bible actually bear that meaning, not only with reference to Jesus, but with reference to others as well. Many others can be called Son of God in this particular way. If we take it that Jesus is literally the Son of God, however, there are in fact uh, logical problems involved in that. For in that case, Jesus would have to be God and man at the same time, and uh, that is a logical contradiction because to be God, you have to be perfect. To be man, you have to be imperfect. You cannot be perfect and imperfect at the same time. And um, if we think about Jesus dying on the cross and we stick to our definition, what is Jesus? He is God. Well, then he, God died on the cross. But if you don't want God to die on the cross, then Jesus Jesus is not God. You cannot really have it both ways. There is a logical contradiction in saying that Jesus is God and man at the same time. <laughs>